I'm Chuck Braverman. This is another episode of West Stock Online. Before we begin, I want to remind you we're brought to you in part by Real Screen, Real Screen Magazine, Real Screen Summit. If you go to our page and scroll down to the bottom, there's an icon there for their events that are upcoming. Click on it and get all the information. They've been a great partner here and uh, helping to spread the word about West Stock. Today, we are talking about a new feature documentary called Desperate Souls, Dark City and the Legend of Midnight Cowboy, directed by Nancy Bursky. Um, and before I introduce her, I just want to say uh, this film is absolutely remarkable and a must see for anybody that's interested in documentaries. I mean, not only is it about a famous, infamous Academy Award winning film, but it's much, much more. So with that little introduction, let me introduce Nancy. Hi, Nancy. How are you? I'm well, Chuck. Thank you so much for that lovely introduction. Well, it's well deserved. I must say I was sort of like unprepared when I watched this film for how stunning it was. I didn't know what I was going to see. Uh, of course, I was familiar with Midnight Cowboy. Uh, it in itself was sort of an earth-shattering uh, event when it happened. Um, it not only won the Academy Award for Best Picture, but it's the first and only picture, I think, that was X-rated that won the Academy Award. And your film is really, your, your documentary is not, in the true sense, all about the making, although it is about the making of Midnight Cowboy, but it's so much more than that. It seems like it's a, a film about our society and our culture and uh, zeroing in on, on New York City, but everything applies to the country and, and what's happening today. And uh, uh, it's just a remarkable piece of work that in itself is pretty fabulous. And I just want to say congratulations to Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you. How did this film come about for you? It's interesting the way you've characterized the film, that it's not about the making of, that it, I like to think of it as more about the moment of. And this fits into my body of work in a way that looks at stories that come that represent a certain moment in time, but also put it on a larger canvas and help us understand why that story, why that event, why that issue is so important in terms of the the bigger picture. Hey, I'm walking here. I'm walking here. He didn't make the movie to crusade about anything uh, at all. He made the movie because he saw something in the culture that was great to take pictures of. Nobody had seen those images and those midnight cowboys on 42nd Everybody's Street. Talking at me. I don't hear words they're saying. Was the very first movie that I ever saw that was a picture of New York that really looked like New York. It didn't look like Easter Parade and Judy Garland was going to come down singing. It looked as scuzzy and dirty as any other part of New York. He was fascinated by America and by New York, by the drama of urban America. No matter what Joe Buck's particular delusions might be, the cowboy theme hustler is a very, very gay thing. I'm not even sure why it got an X. If I'm going to America to make a movie, this is the movie I'd like to make. I had come across this book written by Glenn Frankel on the making of Midnight Cowboy, but I also saw that he was also attempting to put it on a larger, uh, create a larger picture around his story. So I figured we were on the same page, and I talked to him about optioning the book and using that as a point of departure to inspire my film. So there are a lot of things that Glenn has in his book, and I recommend it strongly. It's a terrific book called Shooting Midnight Cowboy. Um, there's a lot of things that he covers in that book that I could not cover. I didn't have the time, and it didn't necessarily fit in with my, if you want to say, vision for the film. But, um, you know, it gave me an opportunity to think about a lot of the issues that took place during the 60s, especially. You know, we're, we're talking about a climate. We're talking about as I say, a moment um, that in, in many ways, if you examine those elements that are taking place, whether it's Vietnam, whether it's the protest movements that are taking place, whether it's the general disruption of society, 
you begin to realize how inevitable Midnight Cowboy is, the film itself. And I think we're trying to make the case in this film that Midnight Cowboy was so inevitable and was so game-changing for so many people who saw it. That's why they remember it so well. That's why people, when I talk to people about our film, they immediately begin to recount when they saw Midnight Cowboy, where they saw it, what they were wearing. You know, it was, it was, it became a touchstone for so many folks. And that's one of the things that we're interrogating here. Why is that the case? Glenn Frankel, um, I have not read the Midnight Cowboy book, but I did read his book on, on uh, High Noon and Carl Foreman because uh, Carl was kind of a mentor of mine when I graduated from USC. I was off in the desert for the summer after graduation at one of four filmmakers making a film about his current film at the time, which was um, McKenna's Gold. Two giants of the screen, clashing in a story that reaches a new peak of high adventure. And so I spent the better part of that summer interviewing, and my film was about Carl. And uh, he and I became friends, you know, in terms of as much as we could, considering that I was the student and he was the producer of the film. And his conflict between being the producer of the film and the writer I thought was interesting. But which was amazing to me was his story about what High Noon was really all about, as he explained it to me, about really about the blacklist and how it reflected what he had, was going through at the time. And I even filmed Glenn Frankel. I think he was doing the tour about the High Noon book at the time. Uh, so well, maybe I'll put a clip of Glenn <laughs> speaking off camera for a minute. But I do want to ask you about distribution. Um, what's the status, or are you, are you right in the middle of that? And, and it would seem to me that the studio that owns the IP for Midnight Cowboy would want to uh, distribute this film. We, are, we have wonderful distributors. Zeitgeist um, is distributing the film theatrically, and then Kino Lorber, they're in a partnership with Kino Lorber, and they're taking care of all the ancillary sales, the streaming, and, and what have you. So we are, that's why we're able to open at Film Forum June 23rd. Um, the opening is taking place in New York and in L.A. at the Lemley Theaters in L.A. and in Film Forum in New York on June 23rd. And that is because we have wonderful distributors. What was the, the process of putting everything together? I mean, well, let's start, let's start with the, the shooting the interviews. Uh, I have to say, you had me at hello with John Voight at the beginning of the film. It's one of the most powerful 90 seconds of interview. I mean, he, it's stunning uh, of Voight talking about Schlesinger collapsing after the last shot and crying in tears saying, what have we done? Um, uh, how many interviews did you, did you film and over what period of time and... What about the choice that you made to shoot them in extreme close-up with a very shallow depth of field? Um, we did about two and a half weeks of interviews, a week in New York and a week, a, a little bit more of a week in New York and a week in L.A. And that's where we shot John Voight and Jennifer Salt. Um, we shot Adam Hollander and Bob Balaban and Brenda Vaccaro in New York and Lucy Sant and um, James Hoberman. In New York, I'm trying to think of who else we shot in L.A. But that, that was the sum title, total of the interviews. Uh, J Charles Kaiser also in New York. So mostly in New York and then a few in, in L.A. Um, and everybody was extremely um, invested in this film. They understood what I was trying to do. Um, I had prepared, obviously I prepared questions that dealt not just with the making of the film, but also what their lives were like in the 60s and how that... <clears throat> how their how their own experiences of the '60s was echoed in the film, and how it reverberated for them. How making of the film um, actually intensified and enhanced their experience of the '60s. 
So um, we had very good conversations, and, and I'm very grateful to all of them. Um, I think they really come to life in this film. They're, the one thing I don't like are very, um, I don't like talking heads as such. I like people who are going to speak with me on a film to be really invested in it, and, and, and I like to feel that they are witnesses to the experience, um, and I think all of these people were that. Um, you asked about the close-ups. I, I think the intimacy of them is, is, is very important for what they're saying. You know, the close-ups give us a really intimate feel for what they're saying and how they're saying it. And, you know, it wasn't something that I necessarily planned out ahead of time. I worked with a very fine cinematographer named Rex Miller. Um, I, it wasn't something that I knew I was going to do, but once we started shooting in close-up, I liked it so much that we continued doing that. We had we had a second. Was it handheld? Yes, it's handheld. That's were, why you were see, they handheld? Yes, it is handheld, and that's why you see a little movement in it, which I think keeps it very alive and 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 not static, which some of these interviews tend to be. Well, they certainly are different than. 98% of every other interview you've ever seen, I don't think anybody gets up that close. And again, that, that, those, those moments with Voight were so magical. And, and, and everybody was terrific. I mean, I love listening to Brenda Vaccaro. I thought Bob Balaban was fabulous. Um, you know, it was, it was uh, they were obviously quite invested in the film. And I love seeing the clips from... Uh, Dustin Hoffman and Voight, you know, from, what was it, Naked City, the, the television show, I think was from both of them, was it? Yeah, from Naked, Naked City, Naked. different episodes. And, and the same year, yeah. Naked City in 1963. And it was it was interesting how <laughs> how Voight apologized, was wanted to apologize to Marion Doherty <laughs> about, about his performance, which seemed very television-y when you, as you, as you showed it, but uh, uh, it certainly wasn't reflective of what he did in Midnight Cowboy, but of course it was a different platform, a different setup, and it, wor it probably worked for what he was doing. Um, how, what was the editing process? How long did that take? Um, I and, worked and with how a, did you work with the editor? Yeah, I work, I work with Anthony Rapoli. Um, he's a very fine editor, and he and I have worked on my last three films together. <clears throat> we, we really love working together, and I'm in the edit every day. So it's, it's not, I, I know some directors will turn over a lot of footage to an editor and then leave and come back in a week or two. And it, that's not the way Anthony and I work. We, we like doing it together. And it's, it's very much like having a conversation. For me, the editing process is thinking out loud and, and having a conversation about what we want to have in the film, putting in a scene and then thinking about, okay, what's the next, wh where do I want this conversation to go? What's the story I'm telling? And I mean, I knew the material we had because we had done the interviews. The interviews were the pathways to telling the story. So knowing what was in those interviews, I could say, all right, this is the kind of issue I want to deal with now. And then I want this to connect to this set of issues. And then I want to weave all of this stuff in there. It's, it's um, my producer, Simon Kilmurray, calls it a kaleidoscopic kind of approach to editing. And I think he's right. Um, we don't have a paper cut. I don't sit down and write down this scene, that scene, and the next scene. It's all, as I say, it's free association. Um, and it does take months. You know, it's funny. You mentioned Simon, who I know from the IDA. And uh, when you know somebody from some place, you, you associate them with that place, not with being a producer of a documentary. And I know Susan also, Mark Olin, uh, who I've met a couple of times, and I think her former company used to represent a couple of my films. Right. And so when I saw their names, I was so pleased because this is, you know, a, I think this is going to be a, uh, you know, just like Midnight Cowboy was sort of earth shattering. I, I love what you did with this film and how you, you say you weaved things together. I mean, this, the 60s, the story of the 60s and the change and going from Woodstock, peace and love to, you know, the riots at Chicago. Um, it, the story has been told, but at the context that you did it within Midnight Cowboy and John Schlesinger and, um, and his uh, struggles within the f making of the film and the homeoerotic sort of 
theme that wasn't, uh, you know, right up front was kind of floating around there all the time. And some of the people that you had talking about that was kind of amazing. Um, Schlesinger, it, it's funny because you mentioned that he came from the BBC and I was teaching documentary production and one of the films that I would run all the time for my students was Terminus, which was a film that he made and we would talk about uh, was it real or was it fake? The, the scene with the child, you know, uh, if which you remember the film, film, right? And and if it and if it and if it wasn't real, you know, it, is it still a documentary? Yeah. So it wasn't real. You probably know that. Um, he he did stage that. He 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 told the kid. He told the little child that his mother wasn't coming back. So he was the little boy was very upset about that. Terminus was really his most important documentary, and it's what led him to make um, a kind of loving because some producers saw that documentary. I think it played at the Venice Film Festival and may have won a prize there. And um, and I think it was one of his producers on a kind of loving saw it at the Venice Film Festival and said, "What do you want to do?" I'm sorry to bother you, but I'm in a bit of a spot. Um, and they moved into um, his first feature film, his first narrative feature. Which is kind of unusual because I think not that many documentary filmmakers have made the, the jump to scripted films. Uh, of course, there are some that have. And I guess Schlesinger, which I didn't realize until I started reading all this. And I tell you, having, I don't know what this has to do with the price of tea in China, but I saw a film on, I think it was on Netflix last night, called Reality, about a reality win winner, the, the, the young lady who was working for the CIA or NSA or somebody and, <laughs> and smuggled out some papers. Have you seen the film? I, no, I plan to, though. So um, do you recommend it? <laughs> and the reason I'm bringing this up is because every word of dialogue is from the recorded recordings that the FBI made the day they showed up at her house to serve the warrant. Every word of dialogue. And at the end, and it was quite compelling, but you could tell it wasn't written by a Hollywood screenwriter. There weren't a bunch of people sitting in a room cutting scenes and rearranging things. It played out like kind of like a documentary, but it was shot Hollywood style, you know, multiple takes and single cam with terrific actors in one scene, one place. And afterwards, I th looked at it and I, th I thought, uh, how do you categorize this film? There, <laughs> there was no writer on the film. <laughs> it's, it was perfect during the strike. You could you could write a lot of films are like you, this because it's just is taking. There, is there no writer getting a credit on that? Because I can imagine a writer coming up with uh, that. Well, I, I don't know. That's a good question because there was. They say right up front, every word of dialogue is from, and then they cut to the actual uh, recordings sometimes, and they cut out certain things that were, you know the the FBI didn't want you to know what she was exposing, you know, whatever. I don't know. I, I had to bring it up because we just watched it last night and I'm thinking, how do you categorize this? Um, I, I looked a little bit at your bio, which is really quite fascinating. You want to tell us a little bit about how you came to be a documentary director? I mean, for instance, I, I noticed that you started as a photographer and a painter, which I think is quite interesting. You know, I guess it... I guess my life is woven together like this film is. <laughs> it didn't occur to me until you asked me that question. But um, yeah, I, I am. I guess my 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 go to talent is visual. I started as a painter, and then I moved into photography. I was a photo editor at the New York Times for a number of years, um, and then I moved to North Carolina and began a documentary film festival called Full Frame, which is still going on. And I'm happy to say for those of you who are listening and are interested in this Full Frame, that we had a pause last year. We'll be coming back next year. Um, and during that period of time, I obviously was totally immersed in documentary film. I always loved documentary film. But even more so while I was running that film festival, I looked at hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of documentary films. And 10 years into that, I found, number one, that I was missing my own creative work, the photography and the painting, 
but I also felt so connected to documentary film that it felt like the right juncture for me to begin making documentaries. So everything I believe fed into the work in the documentary that I started. My first film was The Loving Story. I didn't know there was a law against it. We could go away, but it's the principle, it's the law. I don't think it's right. They sentenced us to one year in state penitentiary. And, and that came, came somewhat as a result of having worked at the New York Times and being very interested in stories of, of like that, the issues around the loving story, which is about interracial marriage and the ultimate Supreme Court hearing that took place in 1967. Um, and, you know, as they say, the rest is history. That, that movie set me off. It did very, very well. We ended up producing, I, I was a producer along with Colin Firth and Jed Dougherty, the film that was directed by Jeff Nichols called Loving. But in between that, I made two other films. One was on Tana Killer Claire called Afternoon of a Fawn. That was made for American Masters. Um, and then a film on Sidney Lumet, which was obviously a joy to make because it meant that I had to sit and watch all 50 of Sidney Lumet's films. Oh boy, you really think he's innocent? I don't know. I love characters who are rebels because not accepting the status quo is the uh, fundamental area of human progress and drama, God knows. You know, they told me about you. Said you're a hard ass, you're a defendant's judge. You know, that was not a hardship. It was wonderful. But then I I, came... I think I've probably seen all of Sidney Lumet's films. I, I was considered naming my first son Sidney, but I didn't. <laughs> so you're a fan of his. <laughs> yeah, he was well, one of my heroes. Well, you might enjoy this film. It's called By Sidney Lumet. And then um, after that, I returned to the issues of race um, and, and, and social justice um, and systemic racism uh, with a, the rape of Recy Taylor. And following that, I made A Crime on the Bayou. And so this film follows a crime on the bio, which came out two years ago. He's attempting to break up a fight. He puts his hand on this white man. He didn't punch this man. That's illegal. The essence of the Southern system in those days was total control. It was a totalitarian nation. Perez was making him do it. Perez made Landry file charges on me. What are, you, what are you working on next? You know, I have a couple of things in, in, that are simmering, and it's a little too soon to say what they are, but maybe I can come on your show another time and talk about them. I've got a couple of projects that I'm <laughs> excited about. It's just too soon I to hope so. Well, my prediction is uh, that once this film gets out, you're, I think the, the response is going to be tremendous. I really do feel that way. I think the film is wonderful, and I think it's a, it's a must-see for anybody who's vaguely interested in documentaries or Midnight Cowboy or John Voight or Dustin Hoffman or acting. I mean, all of these things and, this, and, and society, how you say, you know, it was, it was in the zeitgeist that, that things were changing. And this was about change and opening things up. And so thank you so much, Nancy. You're I appreciate you being a guest on West Dock. You're so welcome, Chuck. It was a delight to talk to you. Mm -hmm.